The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. feel like God's spoken recently that there is a foundational message that is simple yet profound. And I even want to name it what we used to kind of tongue in cheek respond to some churches or some church people when they would respond to the message. They would say, Dennis and Jennifer, oh yeah, that's, that's just that forgiveness thing. And that usually told me they didn't have a handle on it yet. It's just that forgiveness thing. So I in honor of those people, <laughs> I want to call this message tonight, Just Forgiveness. Are you ready? So let's just look at just forgiveness. And I want to start out in the book of Ephesians, uh, because I believe we're in a, in a time of significant warfare, but I think we need to understand warfare uh, from a biblical context. The book of Ephesians was written to a mature body, and a mature body needs to understand the dynamic of what's actually transpiring. And if you were to take the book of Ephesians and oversimplify it, it would be basically a war between anger and the kingdom of darkness and grace. You really could take the book of Ephesians. It's the accuser of the brethren versus entering into the grace, the divine ability to be and to do all that he called you to be and all that he called you to do. So... Here's where the warfare begins. It says, uh, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. That basically what transpires is you give an open door in any uh, of the anger words. And let me, let me cover some of that. It says, give no place to the devil. Let him who steal, steal no more. And let him labor working with his hands for what is good then he may have something to give to them that has need. Now, verse 29 kind of uh, gives you the, the, uh, the, actually, every angry word is found in this next verse of Scripture. I find that interesting. 29, let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth, evil speaking, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, in verse 31, this is a very interesting list, because this list is basically, as far as I'm concerned, heart, part and parcel of the conflict. It said, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Malice actually is a word that's like cancer, maliciousness, intent to destroy or to hurt. But rather, verse 32 gives the, the warfare. But rather, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ has forgiven you. That is just a small portion of the book of Ephesians, but from the beginning, it's warning about, it's all about grace and the divine enablement that's in grace to bring you into maturity and the fullness. And yet at the same time, it's a warning against the accuser of the brethren. So for believers, I believe the, this book of Ephesians, this is not for unbelievers, this is for believers. To simply say, we, there's, a, there's a battle going on even in the heart of a, the most mature believer as to whether or not he will move in the grace and the forgiveness of God or whether he's going to be subject to the accuser of the brethren. That's where the enemy's going to work. He's going to get you to be, to get in the place of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and malice. Resentment, anger, retaliation, revenge, all of that is the absence of the supernatural forgiveness of God. And the forgiveness of God actually brings you into a place of grace to where there's tenderheartedness, forgiveness, but... I want to cover a little bit on forgiveness, just forgiveness, just a simple message. 
And I want to start off by giving you a quote from George Whitfield, 1714 to 1770. This is a statement out of some of his writings. And what he was saying during the Great Awakening was that the doctrines of the gospel are doctrines of peace. And they bring comfort to all who believe in them. They are not like the law of Moses, which consisted of troublesome and painful ceremonies. Neither do they carry with them that terror that the law had. Cursed is everyone who continues not to do all the things which are written in the book of the law. If you were to keep the whole law and break but one point, you're guilty of the breach of all. The law denounces threatenings against all who do not conform to her strict commands. But the gospel is a declaration of grace, peace, and mercy. So here you have an account of the blood of Christ, which speaks of better things than that of Abel. For Abel's blood cried aloud for vengeance. There's a distinction. And I believe that even amongst the most mature believer, if they think forgiveness and repentance is just forgiveness or just repentance, you're actually realizing that at that time, you're moving into the enemy's camp of retaliation, revenge, bitterness. All of those things are indications that you are not in the gospel. And I think we need to take it much more seriously than we're doing in the church. Once, we once had a man come up to us when we taught on this and uh, said, that's a very lofty message. You don't really expect me to do that, do you? And we went, yes. And not only that, but we're going to show you how, because if you don't know how to do it properly, you're going to struggle. And then we taught granularly how to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle from Christ within. And guess what? He was one of the ones that never answered the altar call either. He didn't want to learn. He didn't need to know. And I'm saying if the church has, now he's obviously an exception to the rule, but still, if the church has that kind of attitude, I'm more comfortable in being an accuser of the brethren. I'm more comfortable in hanging on to my bitterness and hostility. If, if that's the case, you're not in the gospel and you need to understand that. So listen, but Jesus Christ, his blood cries mercy, mercy, mercy upon the guilty sinner. If he comes to Christ and confesses and forsakes his sin, then Jesus will have mercy on him. And if, my brethren, you are both sensible of your sins, convinced of your iniquities, and feel yourselves lost, undone sinners, and come to tell Christ of your lost condition, you will soon find how ready he is to help you. He will give you his spirit, and if you have his spirit, you cannot be reprobates. You will find his spirit to be quickening, refreshing, not like the spirit of the world, a spirit of reproach, envy, and all uncharitableness. Uh, that portion of George Whitfield's writing stood out to me more than just about anything when he said all of the doctrines of Christ lead to peace. If you don't live in peace, you're not walking in the gospel because all of the doctrines lead to peace with God and peace with man. You cannot take that away from it and say, I've got a healthy theology. You may have a mentally a healthy theology, uh, but if you're not walking in peace, there's something wrong with the application of your theology. And, be, and that includes, by the way, having unforgiveness towards yourself and beating yourself for your performance. Uh, there's no place in the gospel that allows that, to where you beat yourself for your own performance. That's a standard other than the cross. And if you have any standard other than the cross of Jesus Christ, you've entered into another gospel. We are, and this is fact, the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. Do you even believe that? If you studied all the religions, we are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. That's just common sense. And the church that ceases to forgive. Now, when I say church, I'm not talking about some local church. I'm talking about the body of believers, living stones, the congregation of God, the children of God that the church, individual or corporate, that ceases to forgive, ceases to live. There's no life in religion. As a matter of fact, the church of Sardis said, you have a reputation, you're alive. What did Jesus say? I say you're dead. So, I know your works. 
you have a reputation you're alive. Jesus says, I know your works. You have a reputation you're alive, and I say you're dead. I would say those works were dead. It might look good in appearance, but there was something sincerely wrong with the heart matter. You have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. Christ the forgiver does the forgiving in and through, his, through us. He forgives by the grace of God. And most of us learn grace as the unmerited favor of God. And that's true. But more than that, grace is God doing through your life what you can't do yourself. That'd be another application of unmerited favor. God is doing through you what you can't do for yourself. And I even like uh, Joseph Garlington uh, put together a definition many, many years ago, and I just loved his. To me, it brought it to a whole nother level. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus. I like that better because it's the person. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you or enabling you to be and to do all that he called you to be and all that called you to do. So that means in your becoming, you need grace to be, but you also need grace to perform because it wants to be the works of God by grace, just like salvation, by grace, through faith. It's a gift. It's not something you earned. And when you walk in that, you're walking in the will of God by the grace of God and your will is yielded to his will. It's like a divine romance of wills. And here was uh, one of the key verses that we use to teach people how to forgive properly because people struggled with something as simple as forgiveness. And we would have to teach them primarily that from Galatians 2.20, if it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. How many are familiar with that? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This suggests that it's no longer I who love, but Christ who loves through me, which in turn suggests it is no longer I who forgive, but Christ who forgives through me. So trying to forgive is usually the fund foundational problem. You're trying to do what you can't do anyway. You need to allow that grace, that divine enablement, the will and the purpose of God, for it is God who is at work, both to will and to perform, and yield and let him perform by the grace of God. It's like an artesian well. He will perform when you yield. You open the door of your heart, he comes in. You open the door of your heart, he releases. It's a question of, of the area of the will being surrendered to him. He will work. All right? So Galatians 2.20 basically states that. And Ephesians 1, 7 and 8 says, In him, the person, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace that he's made abound toward us. So Christ, the forgiver, does the forgiving in us. Real forgiveness must belong to a believer if it's going to be supernatural. You must be born again to really walk in biblical forgiveness where Christ, the forgiver, is doing it. Grace is God doing what we can't do. And then recognizing, of course, that it's no longer I that do it, but Christ in me does it. And in uh, understanding even forgiveness, we found out that most people were mentally trying to forgive people and then struggling with it for years. And when it did click over, whether they knew it or not, what they had really done was they had released, many of which did not even know their will was here, they release their will and let Christ do what they couldn't do. Uh, it's a shame. Some people have to get exhausted before they come to that. I say, why get exhausted? Why not just surrender and yield and let him do that work in you? The, the, to the degree you yield, you release God proportionately. So why, not, why struggle? Why wait till you're worn out to yield? Why wait till you're exhausted and then say, oh, I give up, and then see some kind of a result simply because you got relaxed in your will and you allowed God to do? I don't want to uh, stay in that place of striving to live the Christian life properly, okay? So uh, quickly, I want to get into the good stuff, even though this is foundational. Forgiveness must be from the heart. It must include the mind, the will, and the emotions. If it doesn't include the mind, the will, and the emotions, the Holy Spirit does not have you. He must, he must 
rule the mind, the will, and the emotions. Forgiveness is a person, so it's Christ that forgives. It's not an option either. It's a command. I find that interesting because I watch seasoned Christians try to build a case on why they, you don't understand what they did to me. Well, you don't understand the gospel that you don't really have a choice. <laughs> Forgiveness releases us so that our lives won't be poisoned. And that's the beautiful common sense aspect of forgiveness. You don't release them and get them off the hook. You release yourself from being controlled by them. I don't want to be controlled by anybody other than God. So when I release forgiveness, does not mean I condone their behavior by any means. And it certainly doesn't mean they're pardoned. They're going to stand before God before. But I've got to be free from being controlled by someone else. I want to be controlled by the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And if I am being controlled by Him, even in an in a, uh, adversarial situation, if I have peace, I win. And flesh and demons can't outlast peace. Peace wins every time. It's the kingdom. And that kingdom is going to expand to the degree that you allow it to expand in your life. So it releases the other people that God can start working in their life. If God says, vengeance is mine, he isn't going to do anything for that other person if you got your hands around their throat. He'll say, well, you want to play God? Go for it. How's it working for you? You know, staying up late and getting all angry with somebody, is it working? Or you can let them go and let vengeance be mine and let me repay. You honor me by releasing them. All right? And you release yourself from torment, resentment, anger, hostility, physical sickness even. You drink the poison and think you're hurting them. Isn't that something? But forgiveness releases others so that God can work on their lives. But forgiveness is a canceling of the debt. They don't owe me anymore. I've released it into the loving hands of God. Forgiveness is ceasing to sit in the place of judgment. All right? Now, if through the work of the cross, there's a principle called propitiation. That means he was our substitute. If you properly applied and you receive thankfully the gift of God's grace of forgiveness, then the fear of punishment would be eradicated totally from your life. I like that concept because I did a lot of goofy stuff. So, I mean, the fear of punishment, my mother had that down pat. That's how she controlled me because I could run fast. I avoided more beatings by running out of the house, knowing she couldn't chase me. I was a quick little kid, bad and quick, Dennis the Menace. But when I ran, she had a tactic that was, it just, it just conquered me every time. She would say, that's okay, Dennis. God is just. God will get you. <laughs> and I could fall off my bike. I could, you know lose a quarter on the way to the store. It was God was punishing me. My mother got me after all, all right? But in reality, that was the carnality of the fear of punishment of which God said, I took your punishment for you. You have no right to beat yourself or anybody else. You have no right to be angry at yourself or anyone else. That that's sin. And until you start receiving forgiveness for that kind of judgment, you, you are, you're making a mockery really out of the, the, the precious price that he paid to cleanse you of that sin. You know, the benefits of forgiveness, you please God. Oh, gee, that'd be a nice thing to do, wouldn't it? Please God, feel better inside. Nah, we don't want this stuff. We don't want to please God and feel better inside. We want to hang on to that bitterness, anger, wrath, and all that stuff, all that poison on the inside because it makes us feel good. You beat them up in our mind. Yeah, yeah, they deserve that. And it'll make you sick. But in reality, by releasing them and not being controlled, you feel better inside. You start enjoying the fruit of the Spirit regardless of a hostile environment. You grow emotionally. Well, that's a treat. You know, it's cute when a little baby spits up a little bit of milk and it goes, and everybody goes, oh, cute. But if you're 21 years old and you're spitting up stuff like that, it isn't cute anymore. And so God said, basically, you want to live in the fruit of the Spirit, and it's time to grow up. 
All right? And if your behavior, by the way, for all the bright, uh, bright scholars, this, this one's for you. You write this and get mad at me, and then you have to forgive me. But spiritual maturity is synonymous with emotional maturity. You're a Bible scholar, and you act like a three-year-old, and you are not spiritually mature. Probably something terrible happened at three that you've never given over to Jesus. <laughs> you grow emotionally. Is that a good deal or not? Emotional maturity means full stature. It means I'm going to, like the book of Ephesians, I'm going to grow up into him. And you cannot grow spiritually. You can move in gifts, but you can't move in character development or maturity without the emotions being impacted by the Spirit of God and the fruit of the Spirit. So you make better decisions when you walk in a forgiveness lifestyle. You make those decisions from the place of peace with God and peace with people. You're anointed to be a blessing to others. Do you like the idea of being anointed? Or would you rather just stay bitter, angry, and get revenge? That usually doesn't work anyway. And maybe some of the younger people don't think much of this, but the older people better, is that you will have better health through forgiveness because today's resentments are tomorrow's diseases. So the young people need to le listen to that, but there's older people with, with sickness in their body that they ought to start by forgiving whosoever and just say, you, you God, search my heart because I'll tell you what, that came from something. And there's a lot of emotional pain that needs to be eradicated in your life. When you don't, or when you stay in unforgiveness, you're disobedient to God. You have emotional torment. You live with carnal emotions. Your emotional growth is stunted. You make bad decisions, and you hurt people. And your health deteriorates. All right. Now... I'm going to give it to you hot off the press the way God gave it to me as a baby Christian. This is before I had teaching from anybody. He took me to two portions of scripture and literally opened it up. That this so-called thing called forgiveness, I only knew my mother's style. She was Catholic. You know, God's going to punish you and he's going to get you. I was constantly going to get punished. All of a sudden, I used to say, I'm going to ask Jesus into my heart, but you know, with my Catholic upbringing, I was such a bad kid that if I went into that little confessional booth, how many know what I'm talking about? That little confessional booth and confessed my sins, I would have dirty thoughts before I got out of there. And so God would have to, I would have to confess my sin and God would have to strike me dead with lightning bolts because I'm too bad. I'm going to go bad as soon as I confess my faults, I'm going to get bad again. And when I found out I didn't have to go in that little booth, and that I had Jesus in my heart and he was the forgiver. Then I got frustrated a little bit because I had to go to him so often. <laughs> I'm going, God, I've got so many bad thoughts and things that need f forgiveness that I've got to go to work. I can't, I can't possibly be forgiving myself all day long and forgiving other people and go to work and get my job done. But I did it anyway because I could feel his presence and I felt that every time I forgave, whatever was in the way was removed and nothing was between me and him. Peace with God, peace within. And it was worth it. And then I found that even though I thought it was impossible, all of a sudden those periods of time where I was asking for forgiveness got farther apart and I began practicing his presence because anything negative was being removed and anything negative that was coming between me and him. Hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. Those are all the, the toxic emotions that open the gate for the potential for the enemy to run roughshod. So here's the two verses. Here was my download 38 years ago, and it's as fresh today as it was then. And I love it. I, I mean, I could just, I did, I could just stand here and, and bask in these two verses. But when I said that Christ Jesus in me was the forgiver. He gave me two, two verses. John 20, verse 23, and Luke 24, verses 47 to 49. John 20, 23, Luke 24, 
47, 49, it transformed my life. God showed me, because everybody was talking love, love, love. I was going to a church where the man was, uh, wrote a book called Love, 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 and he was known for uh, identification and teaching on the theology of the love commandment, and that was his expertise, and it was love, love, love. God took me home and basically opened this up. John 20 and Luke 24 are two different situations where the resurrected Christ appeared to the disciples. One on the Emmaus Road and then the other in John 20. When he appeared to the disciples on both occasions, don't you think he'd have something important to say after he rose from the dead? He rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples and in both cases, he may not have said it this way but it's the way I heard it, Dennis, go preach the remission of sin. What's the remission of sin? Go preach repentance and forgiveness. Preach that their sins are forgiven, that the blood of Christ has been satisfied. He's taken it into the heavenly holy of holies. Once for all. And all of a sudden, John 20, appearing to his disciples, it was, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain, they are retained. It's not that you in and of yourself do it. It's that you give them the gospel message that their sins are forgiven and they can accept it or they can reject it. Is that true today? They can accept it, they can reject it. But he says, go preach. And I saw this love message, this gospel of love, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, love one another. I said, where the rubber meets the road, it's a forgiveness message and it's a repentance message but not repentance where you're beating yourself with a whip. It's falling into the grace of God as the gift of God and saying, My, that forgiver lives on the inside of me, and if I want to maintain this gospel, I can't be preaching this gospel and saying, I'm a Christian, and I believe the gospel of peace when I have hostility, anger, unresolved resentment, and conflict in my heart. I'm speaking another gospel. That's not the gospel that he appeared to these disciples on the road to Emmaus. The same thing happened. He said in Luke 24, and that repentance and the remission of sin should be preached in my name, beginning first in Jerusalem. Now, if he just rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples, I would think the first thing out of his mouth must have been a priority, don't you think? And he said, go preach the forgiveness of sin. If we are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth, we should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. But that's the, the gospel in a nutshell. And what we saw is that the problem a lot of times with this, this message of forgiveness is that people are getting confused, even believers, and you are not living in the full potential of the power of God that he's got for you because you're confusing the historical record with the heavenly record, right? You've heard this a dozen times, people that have, that have been in our ministry. But it's so important to make that distinction. This contains the historical record. And guess what? In my historical record, I screwed up lots. I don't know about you, but I, I sinned. I messed up plenty. And I have the record up here. It's supposed to serve as correction, reproof, and you don't want to do that again. All right? But in here is the heavenly record. This is the place where Christ the forgiver washes out the pain, the torment, the resentment, all of the toxic attachment to that historical record. So now if I say, I was a murderer, and it's been purified in here, and God says you're innocent through repentance and the forgiveness of sin, and I say with my mouth that I was a murderer from the historical record. I was a murderer, but I'm clean in here. I carry an anointing on that that could help someone who's bitter. Actually, you can be a murderer just hating your brother, right? It could literally minister to somebody who's living in hatred and anger, because this is the heavenly record it has been sanctified by God, purified by God, blotted out as a transgression. He cleansed it. And the portion that appealed to me was David was a man after my own heart who will do all my will. And then I said, David was a murderer and an adulterer. What do you mean David's a man after your own heart? Because the historical record said he was a murderer and an adulterer, but the heavenly record said he was purified and clean. And the word of the God's not going to, he's the spirit of truth. He's not going to tell a lie. David was a man after my own heart, did all my. Do you realize that 
to do all of God's will, you need to just repent and ask for forgiveness and get back into the will of God and be clean again and move with the kind of Holy Ghost momentum that God intended you to move in. But if you're busy beating yourself, judging yourself, criticizing yourself, you are limiting the Holy One of Israel in many ways. You're limiting your potential, and it's self-imposed. That makes it even worse. So if everybody's going to fall in love by forgiving themselves before they leave today, and if you're watching by Ustream, I want to show you something that is really significant that I think uh, is something that I want to get across. I'm going to go slow on this part, but I'm going to finish early, and we're going to pray. All right? Here it is. I say slow, but then I never go slow. If you're a note taker, uh, you, you should have cramps by now. All right? But God laid on my heart that some of the old mystics, uh, one in particular, said that the Lord's prayer from the lips of Jesus, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, said that being Jesus was the son of the living God, to teach someone how to pray, he knew where he came from and he knew where he was going. So when he started out, he started out in the total reality of that truth. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallow, honor, honor, honor my Father. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right? Guess what this mystic said? The mystic said that that grand prayer was like a love net that went out to a, to a hurting world that needed redemption. And those words went out like a love net. And guess what? We should live that prayer in reverse. Where does that prayer start if you went in reverse? It starts out with, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from evil. Isn't that where you started? That's where I started. I needed Christ the Deliverer, that that love net, our Father, needed to grab me out of the mire of the lifestyle that I was living and pull me toward himself. And as he poured, pulled me toward himself with cords of love, it was the Lord's Prayer in reverse, experientially, in a very practical way. This is the way it happened to all of us. He delivered us from evil. And then our heart cry was, Lead me not into temptation. Show me how to live this life. I know this is the way we're meant to live. I need help. I need instruction. Teach me how to live this life. And what's the next thing? Well, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He's basically saying, I'm going to deliver you through salvation, and I'm going to show you how to live this gospel message or how to live in relationship with God, and it's going to be forgiveness. And as you learn to forgive others and you forgive yourself, I'm going to give to you an impartation of daily bread. And daily bread does not just mean food on the table. Daily bread means that portion of the reality of Jesus that you need today. I'm going to give you, is he not the bread that came down from heaven? I know most people like to pray that, that God puts bread on their table, and there's, a, there's an application for that. But the far greater truth is that it's relational. And this whole, this whole Lord's Prayer is relational, but in reverse order is the way you basically live it out. And so you deliver me from evil. Teach me on how to go. And God says, well, then move in a redemptive forgiveness lifestyle. And as you do that, you will receive that portion of me because nothing will be between you and I, and you will grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God, and you, your sustenance was going to be me. And then give us that daily, and then guess what happens when he becomes your daily bread, when the reality of the personal presence of God through forgiveness becomes a reality, and you're practicing his presence, and you're walking in a relationship, then basically his will, he's living his life through you. Remember, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's no longer I who love, but Christ who loves through me. And in the practical rubber meets the road, it is no longer I who forgive, but Christ who is forgiving through me. And what's going to happen? 
your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we're not perfect people, but if you walk the forgiveness lifestyle as a mandatory love commandment, your will, his will would be operating through you. And it wouldn't be dead works because it would be supernatural works. You'd be walking in the works that he prepared before, beforehand for each and every one of us. And then what would happen? His will would be done. It'd be a divine romance of will. For it's God who is at work in you to will and to perform. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. Then his kingdom is at hand. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. As his will is being done, his kingdom is being manifested. And what are all the doctrines of Christ? Doctrines of peace. Sar Shalom, the kingdom of God's peace that's expanding and ever expanding, but it's expanding through believers. That wherever you bring peace, harmony, Sar Shalom, the prince of peace, is operating through you, and that kingdom is expanding. So therefore you would say, God, when I'm expanding your kingdom, and letting peace rule in my heart. I'm letting Jesus rule in my heart. I am in your will because you are living your life through me. Your kingdom has come on earth through me. I'm a vessel expanding your kingdom, a kingdom that is, is going to continue to expand. And what am I doing in that process? I am honoring you. I'm living for you. I'm serving the, the supreme purpose that I was created was to live for you and honor you. Hallowed be your name. I'm honoring you by demonstration, though, not lip service. This gospel of the kingdom, everybody likes to say, that when this gospel of the kingdom is preached throughout the world, then the end will come. Well, that's accurate scripturally, but if that gospel, if that gospel is something you're just preaching and not living, that's another gospel. You're going to preach the forgiveness of sin, and that gospel, like he appeared to those disciples in Luke's account, and John's account, then you better be a forgiver. Don't go preaching the forgiveness of sin when you can't walk in forgiveness. You're talking out of two sides of your mouth. And you're in the battle of Ephesians where it's a war, anger versus grace. The accuser of the brethren versus the tenderheartedness, forgiveness of God that will keep you safe. Some people get a little nervous with this forgiveness message. They're afraid they're going to be walked on and taken over and dominated. And I'm going to say, no, from the place of peace, nobody can control, dominate, or rule someone who is under the lordship of Jesus Christ. When peace rules, God rules. Demons and flesh cannot override. You simply let your yes be yes, your no be no, and don't get into manipulation. Manipulation is like witchcraft. It's a work of the flesh. Say yes, no, and let the pieces fall where they will. But forgiveness is the most powerful tool and command at the same time that we've been ever given to enjoy life in abundance. And we're so afraid when we forgive we're losing something when you're gaining everything. You're gaining kingdom. You're gaining honor. Honor God. God says, hey, honor me, I will honor. But now I want to get you to the next part that just blew me out of the water. Three verses of scripture that our friend uh, William Morford, in his translation of the One New Man Bible, he was in our, uh, in our church in Columbia, uh, South Carolina, uh, for a period of time. And uh, he told us that he, in his translation of his Bible, he discovered three verses of Scripture that were different than probably 30 or 40 of the other ones. Wherever you see in your Bible, I am, I am, doubled, I am, I am, the Hebrew double is to emphasize it. Okay, so there's like 33, maybe more, 36, I forget the actual number he said of I am, I am, there are throughout scripture. I am, I am. But those I am, I am are usually in the Hebrew ani, ani, A-N-I, A-N-I, ani, ani, I am, I am. And the mere fact that it's repeated means I'm emphasizing this. You know, if, if Jesus says truly, truly, he means, I'm emphasizing this. This is significant. But there were three verses of Scripture where it was anohi, anohi. 
And he said he struggled with that as a Hebrew scholar himself. And he says, actually what it means is I am, I am. I'm emphasizing it for the purpose of emphasis. However, it's almost like he's got an attitude saying, you better really pay attention to this. I've got an attitude about this. I am passionate about this. I am not only doubling it, I'm adding my emphasis, an inflection. I'm adding something in the tone of my voice saying, listen, listen, listen. This is important. These are like the three most important I am's there are. All right? And here's what he said. And, by the way, in this order that they're written in Isaiah, all three are in Isaiah. Isaiah 43, 11. Isaiah 43, 25 and Isaiah 51, 12. And this is what, what I saw unfold as far as sanctification and the challenge for a believer to be all that they could be. If you knew nothing other than these three verses, you, it would facilitate, it would change the way church is done if you started living this. Here's three. These three verses is, I am, I am, and I've got an attitude about this. I am your deliverer, and there's nobody can save you but me. Not just I am, I am, but I am, I am, and I've got an attitude about this. So much for many roads to Christ, huh? Or to God, rather. I am, I am, and there's no deliverer other than me. Some translations say Savior. Same thing, but deliverer was, was the better translation. I am, I am your deliverer. What was the last thing or the first thing we said in the Lord's Prayer? Deliver us from evil. That love dragnet of calling humanity, unsaved humanity, toward God himself in the reverse order is exactly the command that's coming forward, straight forward in these three verses of Scripture. He's saying, I am, I am the Lord, and besides me there's no deliverer. The second, that's 4311. The second one Isaiah 43, 25, I am, I am, and I've got an attitude about this. I'm the only one that can blot out your sins. I'm your forgiver, and there's nobody can do it. I am, I am the only one that can forgive your sins. I am the forgiver. Isn't that in the middle of the Lord's Prayer in reverse? That is the means by which we bring kingdom to bear. All of the doctrines of Christ are doctrines of peace, reconciliation, and then this last one, and we're currently uh, writing, having our book on the Sar Shalom and the peace of God is uh, being formed even now as we speak, all just on this last topic. Isaiah 51, 12, I am, I am the one that comforts you, and you shouldn't be afraid of man for what he can do. I am, I am the only one that comforts you. Actually, everything else is a false comfort. And you will find false comforts. When you don't have God's comfort, you will have false comforts. But what is it in the beginning of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy. I honor you, Dad. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day that daily portion, that daily portion of reality of you, bread, the bread from heaven. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish that work. My food is that relationship, that reality of him. Lead us not to temptation. Cleanse us from sin. I, even I, am he who comforts you. He's a deliverer, he's a forgiver, and he's a comforter. And after he comforts you, you have a mandate to do these three things in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you say, I am a believer, and I believe in the gospel, I preach the gospel, I teach the gospel, if you are not living those three elements, you're preaching borderline another gospel. You may be preaching an accurate gospel from the theory realm, but in reality, you're not walking the talk. If you were walking the talk, you would do what Scripture says in Corinthians. As far as comfort, comfort them with the same comfort that you were comforted. But if you weren't comforted, you don't have nothing to give. And you can't give something if you don't have it. 
Comfort them with the same comfort whereby you were comforted. It's talking about a supernatural exchange that you're giving something supernatural to someone, but if you don't have that supernatural peace in your life, you can't give peace. It's a false peace. I was surprised how many Christians entered into a false peace by basically getting what they want. That's called selfishness. <laughs> That's not peace. I want what I want and I want it now. Oh, now that I got it, I've got peace. No, <laughs> you just satisfied your lust. That's not peace. If you, in fact, were going to preach and live the gospel, when this gospel of the kingdom is demonstrated, throughout all the world. That's when the end's going to come. When this is that they would see how they love one another, then the world might believe. The world's not going to believe until they see you love one another. They, uh, they don't see that in the church. They, they mock the church. But it's primarily not as difficult to get there. This would change. If this message got loose, it wouldn't be called, I'm doing it tongue in cheek, just forgiveness just oh Dennis and Jennifer they teach that just that forgiveness message just you're missing the very foundation of the gospel itself just forgiveness means that it's not just something you talk about it's something you do it's something you demonstrate by the forgiver living in you it's too big for you to do and I kind of like that idea that it's too big for us to do that separates us as the people and he's the God you comfort them with the same comfort and you must in order to walk in that level of anointing you must be a forgiver because we're living in an age of the church of reconciliation there's no perfect people out there and there's no perfect Christians out there but there is an adequate witness there is an adequate witness of an imperfect people and I'll tell you how it'll look if you walked in a forgiveness lifestyle, you would actually look like someone who's been with Jesus. They will say, there's someone that's been with Jesus. It will speak, forgiveness speaks louder than you saying, love, 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 love. I love my dog, I love my cat, I love my car, I love my wife, and I love my neighbor. No, you demonstrate it where the rubber meets the road is in the time of hostility. Anybody can love them that love you back. We're talking about in the time of an adversary, adversarial situation or a hostile environment, then you forgive. You're demonstrating kingdom power. And lastly, you're a deliverer. Now, if I can comfort someone with the same comfort, the only way I can give them the reality of the comfort that I give them, they might discern in the Spirit. I can feel the comfort of the Holy Spirit. But until they forgive, they cannot know that comfort. Until they repent, they can never know that comfort. Because they've got to make peace with God and peace with one another. Pursue peace. All of the teachings of Christ are doctrines of peace. It's not like the law of Moses. It's all of the doctrines are doctrines of peace. If the doctrine doesn't lead to peace, there's something wrong with your doctrine. Because propitiation means that he took the wrath and the punishment that we deserved upon himself. It's amazing how many people punish themselves in Christianity. It would be a, a remarkable uh, rise in the anointing of the average church member if all of a sudden they just start forgiving themselves. Not treating it lightly, but recognizing that it's something that only God can do. I can't do it. And then it says, I, even I, am your deliverer. And besides me, there's no one else that can do this. And I'm saying that what God is basically saying, if I were going to comfort someone, I would have to teach them how to forgive, right? I can't do it for them. They can accept it or reject it. But ultimately, I'm preaching the gospel that if I walk in forgiveness, I've got the anointing to preach it and teach it, but they can accept it or reject it, John 20. But God called me to preach the remission of sin, that your sins are forgiven, and it's foolishness not to take advantage of that tremendous price that he paid to wash you clean on the inside, regardless of your historical record. Do you realize how liberating that would be? 
I love teaching uh, young people that have engaged in sexual sin. I taught them without embarrassing anybody. Here's how you can know if you're okay. You repent and receive forgiveness till you feel clean inside. The historical record, it's going to be there. It isn't going to be erased. You can't erase it. But when you think of it and you feel clean inside, that's a victory only Jesus Christ can do. He's the only one that can blot out the transgression. He's the only one that can make you feel clean. You can do whatever you want in religious sacrifice. He doesn't want sacrifice. He said, I've given you a capacity to hear my word and obey. And if you would, you would demonstrate this gospel of forgiveness, then you too could be a deliverer. By a deliverer, it's interesting. I can't do for somebody else if they don't cooperate to the gospel message. And I see these three things that God said he's really, really uh, quite adamant about is that if I was adamant about that, how would it look as a minister of the gospel or as a Christian? How would this look if I was adamant about these three things? If I was his son and I was going to depict the passion of his heart, then I would have to say, I'm going to have the reality of that comfort and I'm not preaching or teaching anything that, won't, that I'm not living. Because I've got to live with myself and God as well as others. And peace has to rule. When peace rules, Jesus is ruling. He's the spirit of truth. He won't put peace on a lie. That would go against his nature. Therefore, if I've got peace, then the next thing I have to do is, remember, they can accept it or they can reject it. Go preach the remission of sin. Simply say the solution to what ails you is forgiveness. You think the problem is that other person, but God's basically saying your solution, even if they're evil, the solution is still inside of you, and it's going to be Christ the forgiver. So choose how you want to respond. You can accept that message, or you can reject that message. And then lastly, if you accept that message and you find out that it works, <laughs> that's what we were so amazed on, huh, Jennifer. We would go to church, how come I never heard this before? It works. Well, the gospel <laughs> works. It's just a lot of times you've made it harder than it needed to be sincere, but you made it harder than it needed to be. And deliverance then, for me, would be not something I can do for you, but to teach you how to get that deliverance through repentance and forgiveness. That's why we call it self-deliverance. Isn't that really what God offered me? He said, I'm offering you an opportunity to get delivered. Do you want it? I had to choose for myself to be delivered. It was self-deliverance. God did it, but I had to accept it or reject it. And what we're doing now is saying, God wants to set you free. Are you willing to be set free? Or are you going to just wander around in your excuses that it's somebody else's fault for the mess you're in? You know, God's basically saying, I'm not going to accept those excuses. I can't heal those excuses. So let's just, let's just pray this. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, if the heart of my heavenly Father is, I am, I am your deliverer, and there's nobody besides me that can deliver you, then I need deliverance from the deliverer that lives on the inside of me. I need you to deliver me from evil. I need you to deliver me. I need to bring thoughts that are not pleasing to you captive to the obedience of Christ. I've got to bring them to you, to Christ within. And Christ the deliverer lives in me. And he is strong enough and powerful enough to swallow them up, to bring them captive. Do you believe that he's strong enough? Then take those thoughts captive. I receive forgiveness for having allowed those thoughts to rule and reign in my mind. God is basically bringing us into the place to where he wants to comfort us and he wants to comfort your thought life. And it's something that we've been going through for the last few days, huh, Jennifer? Isaiah 26.3. This is a good one to write down. Isaiah 26.3 says, I will keep him in shalom, shalom. I will keep him in perfect peace. Perfect peace is the same as saying, I will keep him in shalom, shalom. Perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. But that word mind is the creative imagination. 
the creative imagination needs to be, I will keep him in the shalom of God whose creative imagination, it's good to have a creative imagination, but that creative imagination can be serving one of two kingdoms, couldn't it? Hmm? What, well, basically, what is pornography? Mentally, but imaginations. Using the creativity that God put within you, wrong. Flashing upon the screen of your mind, vain imaginations. Things that are exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. But God says that creative imagination was given for me so that I could pour revelations into your screen of your mind so that you could see revelations, perceptions, that you could come up with plans and ideas that are supernatural, that I would, that the shalom, shalom, the peace of God, peace includes prosperity, that's even in the name shalom, peace, prosperity, wholeness, all things intact, nothing's missing, it's the blessing of God in the path that you walk, and that prosperity emerges as you put your creative imagination upon Him. God gave you, creativity flows from your spirit and it needs the mind to take various data that you have in there and blend it together into a tapestry of revelation and uh, artistic expression in all different forms. But God says, if that mind is not stayed on me in shalom, shalom, you will take that very creative imagination and go off into the extreme, of course, would be a reprobate mind. You will start making up doctrines and theories of your own that sanction your sinful behavior. I've seen that before. The funniest one was the, the, the drug addict that was really liked his pot particularly. He liked, his, he liked smoking his pot, and he said, well, in Genesis, the herbs of the field, God said he made everything good. <laughs> and, said, and my pot's good stuff. I mean, you can, you can build a case for your sin any way you want to. You can make it, get some chapter and verse on it, but that's nonsense. I even heard, I even heard someone say, Oh, the, 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 the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was the sin of inhospitality to the angels. I'm going, these are above average intelligent people. But that's how the beginning of when your mind turns over to the slavery of, of the dark side, so to speak, you start to go toward reprobate. You start coming up with weird little theories and solutions, but they're to compensate for the inability to have given that over to shalom, shalom, and let the peace of God rule and maximize all that he put within you to reach your maximum potential. So Father, right now, tonight, I'm praying for each one that can hear this by means of Ustream, that this should be a classic foundational message. This is just forgiveness. But just forgiveness to me is the love message of Jesus Christ. It's the primary message. And it's the, the message to where you can actually attest to whether or not you are walking in the love message of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we pray that just forgiveness would be the very foundation of our relationship, to be like our Heavenly Father, to say, I am, I am a deliverer, I am, I am a forgiver, and I am, I am a comforter. But I'm going to have to do it the way God called me to do it. I can't make up some other way. That that was his way, that was his rule, and I'm going to let him rule to bring comfort into the lives of people. I'll tell you what, when the peace of God rules, you're going to expand his kingdom. And his kingdom, the Prince of Peace, his kingdom is continually swallowing up anarchy and chaos. You have chaos in your life? You have a little anarchy? Could be there's unforgiveness because God's peace could swallow it up regardless of the hostile environment that you're in. How about this expression? I'm being attacked. Every Christian uses that. I'm being attacked. Why not start with seeing if there's anything in you that has lost your peace? If you've lost your peace, you've got a sign on me, kick me, torment me. Rather than running into the refuge of his lordship, when you run into that secret place. In the last three weeks, everyone in our church has been getting scriptures on the goodness of God. And in the goodness of God, it says that you escape into the goodness of God. It's both a place of safety and it's also a place of protection, safety, 
and um, what's the other word I was looking for? Safety, and it's a defense against the unkind world. And so that means if the world's unkind, there's a place of favor in God that I can run to in his goodness and he delivers me from unkind world and from the words, remember what did we say in Ephesians? What were those words? Evil speaking, malice, slander. See, that's when those things are spoken against you, that's when you react in the flesh and want to render evil for evil, right? Somebody falsely accuses you, you want to render evil for evil. That doesn't work because you're actually no different than they are at that point. You became a perpetrator. You thought you were the victim, but you became a perpetrator when you render evil for evil. But when you run into the goodness of God, you're surrounded by his favor. It's a place of safety and protection, but it's the place where God says, I will deliver you from an unkind world, and in that place of kindness, I will then, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will silence the wagging tongues. Wouldn't that be a better way to do it than you? Plus, he'd be more just than you anyway probably be more merciful to you but nonetheless he's a God of justice and a God of recompense leave it to him you bless them that curse you pray for them that despitefully use you do you do that as a as a habit I do as a habit it's the gut response drop down and release forgiveness to them because that puts me in the place of kingdom regardless of what they're saying and that is the place where the will of God is done on earth as it is in heaven. So, say this with me and we're going to close. All of the doctrines of Christ, All the doctrines of Christ are doctrines of peace. It's a good self-test, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Just forgiveness. Just forgiveness. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.